One of the things that my father very much um, cher cherished is uh, very much he cherished his friends, his family, and his uh, Talmidot and his Talmidim more than anything. And this is a big testament to him how many people, how many, how much people loved him and adored him and respected him. Um, so when I Right when my father passed away, the next few hours I called the Itarachal. I said, this is something we have to do on the Shloshim. The Itarachal was so gracious and generous to offer us this place. And big yashikach to the OU for everything they've done for, for my family and for my dad's family. My dad, it was, um, my father felt this was his second home. This is where I met my best friend at Mencha upstairs 26 years ago. Um, and this is where I met so many of you, and um, this, is, uh, this is really the perfect place to do the Hespit. So, first thing is, is that my father asked, um, asked me a few times, first of all, not to do uh, before he, when he would pass away. He said, please do not do any Hespitim, and do not wait for me to be buried. I want to be buried right away. So, today is the day when he's Baruch Hashem, it's after the Shloshim, and um, you know, we want to be brief here, but we want to, we have amazing speakers. Rabbi Breidowitz is here. We thank him so much for coming, Rebbe. And, 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 and Phil Chernovsky is here to speak. But we, it will be brief. We're, we're not going to be Matriach and Sibur to be here for hours. Um, so, Baruch Hashem, I finished uh, yesterday Mesech Dav Brachos. And um, so I want to do a Siyam. I know that's what would do my father proud. So um, we're going to do like the, the last Mishnah, part of the last Mishnah, and then we'll do um, a Kaddish, and afterwards then the speakers will begin to speak. So we're, we're starting in Resech the Brachos, um, the last, the last parak, the last Mishnah, um, parak Tess, and we're talking about Chayav Adam Levarech Al Hara. So it goes for the Kashem Shu Mivarach Al Tova, Shinemar, Vahafta, Esashem, Alech, Bacholov, Bacholov, Nabsha, Cholmaidecha. So there's a very famous, um, very, very famous story on this Mishnah. And this famous Mishnah is uh, the question is how can we be Barach? How can we be blessed, blessing on something that's a tragedy, on a sadness, on, on a death, right? We say, we, we say Barach Dayanemis when someone dies. But we're, how, how do we do it? So there's a very famous story uh, of one of the Talmidim of the Maggid of Mezrich who um, went to the Maggid and asked the Maggid, how is this possible? How can we, how can we say a bracha on, on tragedy, on, on, on death, on, on, on misfortune? And uh, the Maggid says, go to, um, go to Reb Zusha. Go to Reb Zusha and go to his shul and ask Reb Zusha. So he goes, he goes to Reb Zusha, he sees Reb Zusha in the shul, and Reb Zusha looks like a beggar, he doesn't have like nice clothes or anything, and um, so he asks Reb Zusha, he goes to Reb Zusha, he says, um, Reb Zusha, uh, the Magid sent me, how, how is it possible to be Mavarech on a tragedy, on, on, on a sad occasion? And he said, what's a sad occasion? He says, he says, what's, what, what's, what could be so bad? He says, no, we have terrible things that happen. This and that. He, goes, he goes, do you have something to eat? He says, yeah. He goes, I have something to eat. So he says, well, what did you eat for breakfast? I have potatoes. What did you have for breakfast? I also have potatoes. What are you going to have for lunch? I'll have roasted potatoes. Uh, and then he says, then what do I have to wear? Look, I'm wearing clothes. I have one pair of, I have one reckle for the weekday. I have one reckle for, the, for, the, for Shabbos. What else do you need? So he kept going on and on and on, asking him, and, and this was his answer. So he comes back to the Magid, he tells the Magid the story, and he says, now I appreciate, thank you so much for sending me to Reb Zusha, because now I know why you're supposed to say a bracha, even on tragedy. So the real thing is, 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 is the lesson for us is to understand from this Masechta and everything is, we don't understand, my father used to say this all the time, we don't understand why Hashem does what he does. But it's all for the good, right? We, we have to believe that, because if we don't, then how can we be, um, how can we be devout Jews? We have to believe that everything is for good. I am the uh, youngest son uh, of Ephraim Lezikhar. Uh, I had an older brother, 
Slim Zalman, who unfortunately passed away six years ago. And I have one sister in, did not make it, but she's here in spirit. Um, I'm a little bit uncomfortable speaking for such a touch of Ireland. Please forgive me. Um, I had some thoughts. Uh, we just finished reading, we just finished the Shavuos. And of course the highlights, one of the highlights of the Yomtov is the reading of Megillus Rus. And um, two things struck me, I'm sure everybody, some of, actually some of the Torah that I'm saying now is something which I heard from, from my brother, all those people who put together all the shiurim. You know, I'm sure people here know about it, Rabbi was his dedicated Hamidim, putting tremendous courtes and efforts. So this such a divas by You know, anytime somebody goes and listens to a share, there'll be there'll be a suicide and it'll be a uh, tremendous uh, title in the Shmasa. And um, some of the stuff that I heard, some actually some of the stuff that he said, but the first I think that we go through the Megillah there's two critical moments that stand out. And um, the first, of course, is the moving encounter of Nomi. And, and in this mistake by of the two daughters, the two daughters of course, Arpa and Rus, they start out on the same mission. And they were very close. It was it was it was a very dramatic moment in history of Kali Yisrael. And Orpah was almost there. I'm just going to read from you from the art scroll. Ruth and Orpah were, were of royal lineage, descended from Eglon, king of Moab. It was a heroic sacrifice to forsake their country to accompany the impoverished Nomi. On the country road, in the fields of Moab, was enacted one of the great scenes of history. Three times, Nomi urged Rus and Orpa to go back and go home. They refused to yield. But on the third time, Orpa weakened and returned to her land and her people. And Rose, of course, passed the test. She followed through, she persevered, and the rest is history. She became aim of the Malchus, not just, you know, not, not a regular Yoris, but uh, who knows if Arpa, you know, we don't know how it played out, but the second incident, a few, a few uh, times later in the, uh, in, in the Megillus Rus, we have that Boaz has, has seen some special virtues of Rus, and he intended to marry her. You know, I'm not sure if he knew that the writer did he know it would be Malchus from her, or see something in Malchus in her, or whatever, whatever special quality she had. You know, actually, I just heard my brother say he was 80. And she was 40. And, um, but the Allah was, and Boaz, even though that's what his intent, the Allah was that Taif, who was the closest relative, he, he had first rights on Rus. And he was almost there again. He was at the crossroads. And then, as Boaz told him, if you take the field, you have to take Rus with the field. And he says those, those dramatic words again, like Uchal, Uchal, Ligoil, and Ashkes Azari. Whatever Cheshbet he had. But again, such a critical moment. He came to the crossroads and he could not, he could not make it. As my brother would say, he didn't make it to the goal line. With a 
people ask me, you know, and I think of myself, my brother's life projection, how he, how he, uh, everybody asked me, how did he become such a great, beloved teacher and a, uh, a writer? And uh, it's interesting because he started out in America and, uh, and basically, of course, he get classes, he loved to teach, he loved to learn, he was always learning. But he was really about us in America. And he had this tremendous chuka <coughs> all the time. And he had the tremendous drive <coughs> to, to go to Israel, to teach Torah, to become you know, to make to make a difference in Klai Yisrael, and to, and to make to, to become, and and I don't know. It's just he, he picked himself up. Many people have many people go through life, and they have moments of inspiration. You know, and the, the, you know, especially when it comes to Aliyah. That's one one point. But but to go ahead and make Aliyah. And to become a, a teacher and a rebbe, you know, it's, it's just. And he pushed through. He, he he pushed himself, and he made Aliyah over thirty years ago. Before Nefesh ben Nefesh, it was not easy. It was uh, what year? Nineteen ninety-six. Um, he never lived in the. Uh, center of the city. He always lived on the outskirts. And I believe he did not have a job coming to Israel. But Hashem sent the Yashri Yeshiva first. And he found his calling. We have a tremendous karsatoy for the whole Goldstein family and the Yeshiva family, all the Tamidim over there. He gave him, he, he, he found his, his, uh, niche. Or, 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 how do you say it? His niche. His niche, his purpose. He gave him, he gave him chiyas. And, um, and then, then a few years later, I believe, or so I'm not sure exactly when, he started in the OU Center. And I can't believe, begin to tell you. I said my name is Sprecher. The first question everybody is, are you related to Rabbi Sprecher? <laughs> they, they, they heard his articles, they went to his speeches, they went to diaspora, they went to uh, wherever, wherever it was. He had a tremendous influence on them. This Shabbos, I was in Rechavia. I spent Shabbos in Rechavia. And somebody came over to my wife, and again, the same thing. And she said, she said, I can't believe it, because Rabbi Sprecher was the shachter of my best friend. And he did many shibuchah from his all different places, and, and, um, and you know, in Shiura. And she said, these are the words that she said. To me, he was the greatest influence of my life. I went to every share. This is unscripted. This is exactly what happened. Exactly what happened. Of, um, this this pair Shabbos in the Chavio. It was not easy for him. Like I said, he came basically all alone. Um, unfortunately, about ten years ago, how people know, he had lost a child, and it was very difficult. But through all of all, he never lost his, his focus, his mission. You know, I'm, I mean, after the shiva or the shleshim, he, wait, he went straight back to work. And it was not work. Everybody, if you witness his shiura, you know, it was life to him, and he gave life to the students. There was always interaction. Everybody, you know, felt part of the shiur. 
and he saw it on his face of that something that he believed and lived in. So the Gemara says, we just finished a couple of passages ago, called Hamalamet ben the night Torah, kill a Yoda. So if you're a teacher of Torah, the Gemara says, it's as if he gave birth to them. He gave them chiyas, he gave them life. It's almost as if you are parent to them. So I won't be medayik. It says keilu yolda. But it is, even though tamidim achashu and this, but there's still a special relationship to his real children. And who can forget the gleam in his eyes when uh, Miri and Yaini, Toby and Yossi, and the grandchildren would come and it would give him tremendous chiyas and nachas and kilei kamayim kamayim pal ma pal kilei kol adam. The same dedication and love that he had to his children, special love beyond Tamidin. I believe we saw. The last couple of years, the tremendous Mesiris Nevesh of Yoyni and Mary here in, here in Israel, as he was going through all his challenges, tremendous medical issues. They put in all the efforts. I have a friend who was Mamish, he said he never saw, Adafa told me, he never saw such dedication. And, and as from Yoyni and Miri here in Israel to try, to try under difficult circumstances to give my brother the best care and pull him out of the situation he was in. Toby was in, Toby was in America. His, his daughter Toby, I don't know if everybody knows him, knows her. And it was very difficult during the COVID period, but she was on the phone, she made Zoom meetings, she called the State Department, she called the Ambassador. She went Manish above and beyond to try to get into the country because she felt that it should be hands-on. It should be hands-on. It would be, she would be able to get a better hold of the situation. And so, I just wanted to leave with the bracha, that the, the bracha and the school of the Torah which is the biggest school in the world. And I give them the bracha that they should both have long lives and nachas and simcha. And my brother should be a male of Jaisha for them and for the whole difficult situation today. I know he took everything to heart, all the kabbanas, I mean, I know he wouldn't rest, and uh, he should be just a male shayisha for the family, for his friends, and for Gantz Klavi Yisrael. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Mendel and Aunt Feige. They've been there through, throughout everything, always. When Name of Mary and my sister needed someone to be there. He's always been like a second father to me. Um, so the next guest we want to, to invite is one of my father's closest friends, colleague, former boss, whatever you want to, Phil Janowski. My position as educational director here for many years, my first contact with Ephraim was the question, is he going to be teaching here? I don't remember exactly how long it took, but we went with him. And over the years, he proved himself to be almost unique. There are three, three kinds of teacher-student, Rebbe, Talmud relationship. 
One is Rav Mufak, the other is uh, Talmud Mufak, which hardly exists today because of it means all my Torah came from one person. Then you have regular Rav and Talmud. Anytime you go to a shear, the person giving the shear is the Rav, you're the Talmud. The other one is less common, and it's called Rav Chaver and Talmud Chaver. I found that Ephraim Sprecher was unique here at the center in becoming personally involved with his students, mentioning them by name in the middle of a shear, asking them, bringing things out from them, and on the practical side, we used to have him speak whenever our microphone went down. Um, the only speaker we've ever had that never needed a microphone. And uh, that's why I thought it was ironic that his brother was having trouble with the microphone. And, but seriously, the thing that stands out in my mind is Ta'anit Sibur. The various Taniyot Sibur in the course of the year, we had something which we started here called a slow paced Mincha. Regular Mincha 120, same pace of every day. Slow paced Mincha, people were warned in advance. It's going to take time. We gave everyone a chance to daven his own Amidah before we start the repetition. And he almost always gave a full shear an hour and a quarter before Mincha, and then introduction to Mincha I did, and Mincha, and then between Mincha and Meirev, and it was a very, very meaningful program, which, as I said, stands out in my mind. I want to share with you a Tavar Torah that typifies Rabbi Ephraim Sprecher. Its source is the Sefer Charidim, not the same word that's used today in common uh, language. Sefer Haredim goes back to the 1500s, and he writes there that when a person shares Torah with another person, be it a personal one-to-one -one Devar Torah, or a mini shear, or a drusha in shul, or a regular shear, anything, the if the transmission of Torah is mind to mind, then the person is fulfilling the mitzvah of vishinantam levanecha. That's the mitzvah to learn and to teach Torah. If, however, it's more than mind to mind, it's heart to heart, then in addition to the mitzvah of limud Torah, the person is fulfilling the ahavta et Hashem elokecha. The mitzvah to love God, love his Torah, love his mitzvot, and share it with other people, not to keep it to yourself. That was Ephraim Sprecher. That's the Dvar Torah that, to me, if I had to pick a person to attach to it, it would be him, as evidenced by the people who have turned up today. And um, I just... Uh, Wish the family the best, and uh, that Ephraim should be the Melech Yosher for the family and for all of Klal Yisrael. He is a Baruch. Amen. Okay, so for the next uh, speaker is my sister Tova Markowitz.
until you came when he was sick. It meant so much to us. And learning every, every time. Yoni would say, this person came, and David Harrell came, and Nahaba um, would come and bring my father cheesecake. Each person, it, it really gave us like a breath to say, it's, we're not alone. With Corona, we felt so alone. When we were, and especially me in America, trying to break down the door to be allowed to come in, it was extremely frustrating. And uh, it, it, was, it was so hard, and I kept saying to my dad, Tati, I'm coming, I'm coming. I felt like such a liar, because every time I tried to come, they would stop me. And I stopped telling them I'm coming, because I felt terrible to make his hopes up. And I would just say, I will see you soon, and I'm trying to come. So I changed the sentence. Because every time they, they would, you know, you finally were allowed to come, and then they would lock the doors again. So um, it was extremely frustrating and extremely heartbreaking. My father suffered terribly the last few years. And we really lost him twice. We lost the man he was four years ago. And that, that was extremely painful. And then we always, we lost the hope that we'll get him back. We never gave up hope. My uncle Mendel was always there for us. And the moments that we would, we would get frustrated, we're like, what else should we do? And Uncle Mendel always would say, we can do something else. <laughs> he would say, let's try this. Did we try that? Let's make this phone call. I'm so sorry. But uh, I wanted to be able to express how much each and every one of you meant to my father. It's very, very true that of my dad, that each time he had every person he had to interact with meant so much. And I do think that's unique. And I don't think that that's something that every person, that, that, that every teacher does have, I think it really, really mattered to him. And every person's name, and knowing about their lives, and being involved, there's new clubs, and being involved in their learning, and their um, development really made a difference to so my father. And he would talk about his students to us all the time, when I would call him from the States, he would mention this student or that student, and, and he met this person and met that person, and, and I see a few faces around the room, and walking around Jerusalem, I remember it would be so interesting because people from all walks of life would stop us and say, wow, my friend, my wish was your next year, I'm coming, and my daughter and I, every time, like, like a person, like it wasn't, you know, usually you would think it's a certain group of people, you know, or, or a certain age group, or a certain geographic, and it was always different people from lots of different places and, and different walks of life, and it, and it was really always so heartening and, and so special and, um, and very unique. Um, but my father loved this country more than anything else, and he taught us that it's in our blood to live for Israel. And it's very true. The Ich Chayal meant so much to him. And he would say something that um, it was interesting. I was reading somewhere, um, someone said that I said, my father used to tell me this. Whenever you're in a city, someone said that there's a city a lot, they said there were no Sadiq in Bukhari to visit. And then the answer was that you should go to the, the military cemetery because every single Chayal is, is a Sadiq. And my father used to say that over and over. He said, he, he actually, I don't know if any of you know this, he actually tried to enlist when he arrived. <laughs> and they told him that he was too old. <laughs> but he was very disappointed. He really wanted to serve this country in any way he could. The army lost him. He really did. And he said, and he would say that he could, one could never reach the levels of, sati, uh, of, of righteousness that a chayal can. And, and for him, each and every chayal meant so much. And, I try, and I know Yomi tries also to, to honor and serve the soldiers of this country in his name. So that's something um, my father has taught us. And um, 
I just, I, it really does mean a lot to each and every one of you who came today and each and every one of you who called my father and Ephraim, who was with my father so many days and for months and months and months and weeks and, and really sat, stood by my father. And it was a really hard thing. Izzy Broker called my dad every single day for years and years and called us and also rang the bell. What else could we do? What else should we do? What else? And it was the fact that he had so many loyal friends who were always there for him and continued to the end when it was really, really difficult. It was not easy. Um, and I think the hardest part of it was the, the depth of the loss from going from someone. David was there so many times. I saw David there with my dad. I think you were even there about the week that he passed. It really means, I, I, I want you all to know that every visit really was for him, but for us it was an encouragement. It was a, a made us feel, you know, that we weren't alone and that other people were also trying. Because it felt like at a certain point, we're like, what else can we try? We tried every different doctor, every different medication, every different, and, and it just never, unfortunately, didn't have the results we were looking for. Um, but the, the, the magnitude of the loss, I think when we were in it, we were just, it was very difficult and it was troubling, but we always had a hope that we would get him back. Um, but it was a, a very difficult thing to see him on a day-to-day -day basis from what he had been to what he was. And I think now that he has unfortunately passed and he's no longer suffering, we are able to really mourn for the person that he was. And I think that's the way we want him to be remembered and um, really very, very special that so many people, he meant so much to so many people and the Torah that he taught and he did, he loved it. Every single word. It's funny how some people view religion as a burden, but he never did. And I think he taught that. And I think he was able to teach that because that's how he lived. He, he really was meant so much to him to live in this country, to be in this country, to be around other Jews, to try to help other Jews. Ever since I was a young child, he was always hosting people. I know Uncle Mendel and Tati together would host, and sometimes they would take turns. And, uh, and that, you know, so he was always doing, trying to do something and trying to keep the family together. He made our family Hanukkah parties and he loved it. And he was always trying to do something innovative, and, and he always liked to reach out to old family members, whether other people had attachments to them or not, no matter what their religious levels were. He always wanted to maintain a connection, and he valued family, and he valued all the important things, and I think he did teach us those things. And I just want to thank my brother for being there. And I wasn't able to be here. And, uh, it was always there in spirit. I was always, I'm always trying to do whatever I could from America, but it fell short, unfortunately, due to the distance. I said, it's all these years I'm traveling. My dad moved when I was 14 years old. The time difference never got shorter, and the distance never got shorter. <laughs> I'm always waiting for them to fix that. I don't know why it needs to take the 12-hour flight. Is uh, well, the prices keep going up. But um, I want to thank each and every one of you for coming. I apologize for being so emotional. Um, <laughs> thank you, but it really, I, I thank you. I want to thank We all feel the same. Yeah. Yes, it was, I want to just try to take the good things that he taught us and to teach our children and uh, to do good and, and to learn and always find something new and different. And I think something else that someone mentioned to us during Shiva, like he always made it fresh and new and interesting, like a lot of times. I think that it, it sometimes it's hard to teach Torah in a new and fresh and exciting way. And he, he also taught it like he loved it, and he was like a, like like learning it for the first time, even when it was something that was something that we've learned and said before. He's learned it, I'm sure, many many times. And all the time, my kids will ask me for a Torah or something they need for for school, and it was, my first thought is to say, "Oh, Tati would know. Tati would know," and he did, and he would love it. So. He would ask him anything, and he really always had an answer, and, and, and the right answer. So, but thanks again for the love and for the support and for the memory, and just.
God only continue his memory in life. Every bit of Torah and every good deed. Thank you. Um, so one thing is, you know, you see all these faces and uh, your memories start popping up and especially during the Shiva, during the Shloshim, I got calls from people I haven't heard 50 years, 40 years, my father's oldest friends and, and, and family cousins from all over the world and students from all over the world. And um, there's a story that I want to share with everybody before uh, our main for the, uh, our main speaker, right, right away. Um, it's not always easy being the rabbi's son. <laughs> really, it's, uh, you know, you're like, oh, your father did this, your father said that. I'm like, what am I, chopped liver, right? <laughs> right? Because like, all the time, oh, your father, he's amazing. I was like, no, I know already, I know. He's like, oh, that rabbi Sprunker. You know, I'm like, okay. So, but I tell you, there were a few perks. One of the perks is free hot dogs from Zalman's. <laughs> Whenever I was in town, I'm like, Dad, you want to meet at Zalman? He didn't have a cell phone, so I call him in the yeshiva, but Rabbi Goldstein yeshiva, the diaspora. Can I speak to, speak to Rabbi Shprek? Go into, someone have to go in, get in the base mesh. Okay, we went for hot dogs. But then when he goes, he became very close with Zalman, and, and Zalman wouldn't charge him. And then for dessert, he would say, Zalman, what is this? You have no dessert? So Zalman says, don't worry. He goes next door to Kofex, comes back with, with uh, cakes and cookies and, and macaroons or whatever they have there. And he says, okay, here's, here's dessert. So, you know, there, there were perks of uh, being my father's son. And it's so interesting. It's like I'm only really realizing these things now. I mean, you know, like after he's, you know, he's with us, but not physically with us. Um, so that's one of the stories I remember. Another one of the stories um, that, uh, that someone actually told me, one of his students called me during the Shiva and said, um, Rabbi Goldstein, who was his very right, Mordechai Goldstein, his son is here, big chash of a rabbi. And his father said to him, he says, do you know why Rabbi Shbracher is such a good teacher? He says, no. He says, he's very different than everybody else. Because when he teaches, he teaches the way a child would teach the Torah. He teaches it in such a exciting and, and, and this artistic way that is just the enthusiasm that, that would come out from him would be like, wow, this is cool. Even if I didn't like Torah, now I like Torah because he's like making it into something like a TV movie. I don't have to tell you, right? Everybody's like, oh, this year it's on the doors. You know, break on through to the other side. What is that? You know, we're breaking on to the next Om Haba. Much, every single time. And I never thought, I used to laugh. I thought it was a joke. But now that I think back at it, and you know, I got into some of his music, the 60s music, because of him. And I'm like, really? Yeah, he really connected. And he connected with the people. And, you know, he would say to the person, oh, Moshe, oh, Yehuda, every single time. So even if you were sleeping, he would wake you up. <laughs> you know, every single time. So you were always entertained. And he, that's how he, he lived the Torah. He, he believed in animated Torah. And that, that's very different. It's very, very different. I can't tell you how many shivas I went to. Right? I didn't have too many animated people there. But like, I always went with that. And the, one fun, the funniest thing is, the one that I was supposed to learn Torah from, my grandfather said to my father, you, I will learn with you. So I learned with my grandfather, Bashal Zayi, Zayi Pesa, would learn with me, Chomesh, and he wasn't animated. He was very old school, you know, Algemeiner, very, you know, Yiddish, English. That's how I picked up Yiddish from my grandfather. And my father had this whole different way of thinking with different pshatim and different, oh, uh, this is a story. You're going to love this story. I had a rabbi and his friends with my uncle, and they'll probably tell today's name, Rabbi Ansbacher. Rabbi Ansbacher from Chaim Bolin Yeshiva, very, very special person. He was my fourth grade rabbi in Chaim Bolin. And I failed the test. Like I, I got like a 40 or a 50, very bad. I come home with the test paper. And I give it to my father, and I said, uh oh, I didn't do too well. Father looks at the test. He says, What are you talking about? You aced the test. I said, What, 48 is like an ace the test? I mean, seriously, you get 10 points for your name, but 38, <laughs> right? 48 is not a passing grade. He's like, No, no, you got 100. I said, I got 100? Don't worry, I'm coming with you to Yeshiva tomorrow. Comes with me to Chayyabullah the next day, 
he says to Rabbi Ansbach, please come out. So Rabbi Ansbach comes out with me. And he says to Rabbi Ansbach, what are you talking about? He did great. Every single answer is correct. He says, what do you mean? It's not correct. This is not how we paskin. This is not the law. He says, what are you talking about? That's not you paskin. I paskin like this. It's according to the Rambam. I paskin like the Rambam. 100. Gave me 100 on my test. I think it was like the only 100 I ever got. Really? Anyway, so, okay. I want to be brief. So, um, so first of all, thank you for everybody for coming and, and Mamish being part of this. And My father's first 70 years were amazing. The last four or five years were not. But we don't want to remember those last four or five years. At least I don't want to remember those four or five years. His 70 years, he lived his dream. His dream was to come to Eretz Yisrael and learn and teach Torah, and he was able to do it. So, you know, if we all are able to do our goals and set out our goals the way that he did, we would all be in, you know, we'd always exchange those five years for 70 good years, or at least he was here 30, 25 or 30 years in Israel. So, Baruch Hashem for that. And his favorite, favorite speaker and Rebbe was Rabbi Breitowitz. And I asked, that's why I emailed and I texted and I had Charlie, my father's, one of my father's closest, closest friends, run after him in the yeshiva in Or Samach. Please, please, can we find Rabbi Breitowitz? My father could watch Rabbi Breitowitz on YouTube. He didn't know how to press the button on the computer. So I had to, you know, come and press the button for him. And he didn't know what a loop meant. I said, you could just put it on a loop. He didn't know how to do that either. <laughs> but he loved to listen to the Rabbi with Shiro, so we are so lucky and and Mamash so to have the Rabbi Rabbi with be with us. So thank you much. Thank you. It's a uh, certainly a great honor, but a very sad honor uh, to talk about uh, really such a great, great uh, person, a Marvitz Torah a person that I impacted on so many lives. And I can tell you, as soon as it was published in Torah Tidbits that I would be one of the speakers, I immediately got emails from all sorts of people who wanted to include this story and that story and that reminiscence and that memory uh, because they wanted things to be brought up which were Hashem. So many beautiful things have been brought up. I, I want to share with you uh, one little thought that I think perhaps encapsul encapsulates from the Friday. The Mishnah says in Masechus Chulim, it makes an observation that Kohanim and Levim are subject to opposite disqualifications. A Kohen gets disqualified from doing the service by virtue of physical disability. If a Kohen has injuries, a Kohen cannot serve in the Beis Hamikdash. But a Kohen is not disqualified by age. There is no mandatory retirement for Kohanim. If he's 95 and he's not uh, physically injured, he can serve in the Beis HaMikdash. With a lady who does the singing in the Beis HaMikdash, it's exactly the opposite. A lady does have a mandatory retirement, which is pretty young. A lady at 50 already is retired. But if a lady has a broken leg, there is no disqualification. So for a Kohen, it is the moon that disqualifies and not the age. For a Levi, it is the age and not the moon. Now, this is derived simply by looking at the psukim. I mean, how we know this is very simple, but the Gemara doesn't give any logic behind it. It doesn't give any reason for that difference. But there is a thought that's expressed by the uh, third Rebbe of Chabad, the Tzamech Tzedek, that says that the Kohen and the Levi represent two different aspects in Avodah Hashem. The Kohen is what you might call the stickler for rules. You know, in, in, in the case of Korbanos, anyone that studies the laws of Korbanos knows that there is no room for improvisation or creativity. You've got to go by the book, quite literally. And if there's any little deviation from the exact complex sequence of Korbanos, the whole thing is invalid. So the Kohen represents the person who meticulously follows the Halacha without any deviation. The world of the Levi is a very different world. The world of the Levi is Shiva, Zimra, song, music, spontaneity, creativity, emotion, feeling. The Kohen kind of follows the straight and narrow path. The Levi embraces the world of Regesh. 
Now here's what the Tzemach Tzedek says. With respect to following a set path, age is not a problem. The older you get, the more set you are in your habit. So you keep on going. The only thing that could stop the Kohen is physical disability. There's physical disability, and never a moment you can't go on. With the labor, it may be the opposite in some ways. When you're caught up with emotion and passion, you can even transcend your physical disabilities to some degree. But the problem of the Levi is habituation. You get old, you lose your enthusiasm. So for a Levi, the risk is losing enthusiasm. For the Kohen, the risk is physical disability. The Kohen is the world of rules, and the Levi is the world of emotion. The Tzemach Tzedek tells us that to be a complete Jew, we have to be kind of a microcosm of the Beis Hamikdash. We are a Mishkan of the Shechina. We have to be Kohanim and Levim. You see, if all you are is a Kohen, you're following the rules. But there's no heart, there's no feeling, there's no enthusiasm, you're just a robot. If all you are is the Levi, so you have wonderful emotion, but it's simply, you know, narcissistic spirituality that's not rooted in the Ratzon Hashem. <laughs> You need the Kohen to be connected to God's laws. You need the Levi to have a feeling heart. I think what all of us have heard today, what all of us knew, even before we came in today, is Rebbe Ephraim was a person, I mean, I assume he was a Yisrael probably, but, but he was technically a Yisrael, but in terms of his religious persona, he incorporated both the Kohen and the Levi. He kept the rules and he taught the rules and you know he didn't compromise things in the interest of political correctness or whatever it is. Halacha <coughs> was halacha, maybe in your case he gave you a break for minority opinions, but <laughs> even for you that was only one type of, one type of exception. Uh, he was stark, he was not a person who compromised on principle. But at the same time as we heard so beautifully. He was a person of emotion, a person of feeling, a person of care, a person of enthusiasm. He didn't just follow the rules, but he saw them as sweet and as good. And because that is how he lived his life, he was able to communicate that. You know, there's an old motto in the world of salesmen. You can't sell what you don't buy. The teacher cannot convey a certain approach to the Torah unless that's what they really, really uh, believe in, and that's how they live. And that, as we heard, was the secret of his success. Everything he taught is what he lived. Authentic, honest, true. And people knew that. People sensed that. People were attracted to that because they saw that here was a person without pretense, without cover-up, without lies, and you know, all of us you know, tell lies in various innocent ways. But he avoided that in every way. You know, um, I, had the, I had the privilege of almost 10 years of being a proverbial fly on the wall. Uh, what do I mean? Here in the OU here, uh, until October 7, unfortunately, against the Shushan, we, the Muhammad should, we should have Shalom, and in addition, we should come back to the OU for our Sunday morning uh, shir. So I would give share from 11.15 to 12.15, some years 11 to 12. And then eventually we'd be around an hour. Sometimes I stayed, so often I stayed, sometimes I couldn't stay. And Rev. Ephraim gave a share after Mincha. But he always showed up around 12.30. I think the official excuse was he came from Mincha. But I don't think that was the real reason. He could have gotten to Mincha wherever he was coming from. The real reason is, he wanted to schmooze with whoever was around. <laughs> and as fly in the wall, although I guess I shouldn't eavesdrop, but you know, it was such an interesting conversationalist that you know, I couldn't tell <laughs> over here. And the one thing that I saw over and over again for almost 10 years, almost 10 years, number one, the sense of humor the idea of being a Buddha, of being a Bria, so he was able to connect to everybody. If it was a Talmud Chacham that he was talking to, they talk in advanced learning. And if it was a person who didn't have any background, 
They can talk about nice cars, buses, uh, ice cream, or whatever it would be. Every person was felt felt important. Every person felt validated. He was able to connect to every person based on their level. And again, indirectly, he, we try to elevate it at some point to some tone of thought, but he didn't push it. It was a very gentle touch. And this idea of really it's the meet of Amrana Kalin, another way in which he was a Kalin. The Oe Shal, the lover of peace, the pursuer of peace. Oe Besagrios, he loved Hashem's creations, all God's creations, Umakarman La Torah, to bring them near to Torah. So the Hassam Sofer explains that these are not two different qualities. Rather, the way you bring people to Torah is by showing them love. Oe Besagrios, and Al Yede Kach only, your Makarman La Torah. Uh, we heard the Pasuk, I Phil uh, quoted uh, the Pasuk, we have to have a lokecha, that when Torah goes from heart to heart, you fulfill a uh, loving God. Let me just add a little bit to that. The Gemara Masechus Yuma has a drasha on the Ahavda is Hashem Avokecha, that in addition to its primary meaning, that I should love God, it also means Shem Shemayim Nisahev on Yadecha. The name of Hashem should be made beloved. And once again, uh, over and over and over and over again, we saw through Ephraim's persona, his, his personality, his humor, his connection to people, the love that he had, the love and the respect. <coughs> he wasn't like loving you from being up there, you're down there. Rather, there was a respect. Yeah, well, in truth, he was indeed much higher than most of us. But, you know, that was not what he was conveying. He said, a man of the street, a man of the world, kind of guy from New York, whatever it would be, and through the respect and the love that he showed people, he made the name of God beloved in the eyes of others, and he brought them to Torah. So there are advantages being a fly in the wall. Um, I, I learned different ways of how to try to teach and how to try to connect. Uh, he was a role model, you know, even from a distance, besides the direct, uh, the direct uh, connection. Uh, and it was just a remarkable, remarkable thing. You know, in many ways, I, I just read, I didn't know this, that uh, he was a Muslim from Rebecca Kamenetsky. I, 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 did, I didn't know that, but I knew Rebecca Kamenetsky a little bit, and I can now see in retrospect how much of the details of his great Rebbe he himself absorbs. So in a sense, he was a Talmud, not just in uh, formal learning, but in Midos and Ben Adam Lechavero and the way to build people up, rather than knock them down. You know, so much of our educational system, and sometimes even our parenting, is about criticizing, about knocking people down, about pointing out all of the flaws in people. But the truth is, although obviously there has to be room for that sometimes, otherwise you never correct things, but when you put too much of an emphasis I'm knocking people down. They're never going to be built up. You got to build them up. You got to strengthen them. And then you can address whatever needs to be addressed. And that was his educational strategy. I know, as all of us know, that the last years were not easy. A man who had the height of his talents, the height of his abilities, with so many Talmudim, so many Shigur, besides the, the, the physical sufferings of illness, but simply losing the ability to do what his passion in life was and what so many hundreds, if not thousands of people depended on adds, I think, a tragedy that even goes beyond illness itself, as devastating as illness is. But in some ways, even these tragic final years were a lesson. They were a lesson in Amuna, a lesson in faith, a lesson in holding on to life, even when life does not have all the satisfactions that you hold. So these are tragic lessons. These are lessons that we wish he wouldn't have had to go through, and these are lessons we pray that none of us will have to go through. But they are lessons nonetheless. So he taught us in his life, and he taught us in his years of decline, and uh, through his Talmudim and through his website, I think there's almost 500 Sure, I'm on the website. He'll continue 
uh, to teach people. In fact, just hearing from his children, I see how much they absorbed, and they will pass it down to their children, and their children, and their children. So, as I'll say, Sadiqim be Mishlasan Kriyan Chayim, the righteous are considered to be alive, even in their death, because all that they teach continues to be perpetuated down the Torahs. So, Yehi Zechrei Baruch, we will not forget him, we will continue to learn from him. And the Ezra Hashem, may all of us be Zohar to make a Shulema, where Mamas will be Batel, and we will all be united once again. So, just thank you so much for my bride and thank you everybody for coming. One, one last thing. I, I know my father will, would haunt me from the grave if I didn't say this. Um, but so it, one, his best friend Izzy told me, um, I think a day or two after, after my dad passed, he says, you know, you're very lucky. I said, really? Why am I so lucky? He says, I don't have the same way of remembering my family. He says, you have YouTube, RabbiSprecher.com, websites on the OU. He's, he's always alive. You can always watch this year. So the last thing I'm going to say is if you ever miss him, you can go to RabbiSprecher.com. You can go on YouTube. You can go to the OU Center and, 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 and listen to his archives and things like that. And he right. right. really lives on and everyone. It's all big close to you, a lot of you, because that's what he lived for. He lived to teach. He lived to teach and he got so much joy out of teaching that, that is, we have to remember him that way. So thank you so much for coming. And